were just chanting a little bit earlier, we chanted the Metta Sutta. And um, <clears throat> we came to one line and uh, I noticed that, that uh, uh, we chanted two different words at the same time. And uh, by one, one translation, by not holding to fixed views, another translation, by not holding to false views. And I already spoke about this, I think, last year sometime, but it's, it's a very important topic, so I, I, I feel like discussing it again. Uh, and why is it that here we are as a group of people and we're both at the same time, some of us are saying fixed views and some of us are saying false views? I thought that's quite interesting. So this is my talk, topic of the talk tonight, will be on views, fixed views, false views, right views, wrong views, no views. <coughs> when I uh, came from, uh, I flew from Canberra this afternoon and uh, on the plane, sitting next to the plane uh, was uh, this, it was quite funny actually because we were sitting there, I was reading a book and uh, uh, I've been doing some uh, uh, book I was reading was a, a, uh, a historical study of the the um, cult and the worship of uh, the Virgin Mary, and uh, as it happened, next to me was sitting this um, obviously quite strong born again Christian who was sitting reading her book, and I, I, I admit I kind of peeked at the the contents of her book, and it was kind of fulminating against all the kind of the Pharisees and Christians who had different kinds of wrong views and things. And uh, at the end of the, <clears throat> towards the end of the journey, she sort of sort of started asking me, you know, what, what religion are you and blah, 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 and what God do you believe in? I said, we don't believe in a God. That was quite hard to compute. There was this kind of thing, thing, thing going on behind her eyes. What? No God. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> I, I found it was interesting, you know, looking at my own reactions because I felt quite awkward, you know, and uh, I didn't really know how to respond. You know, basically, I had to admit I really didn't want to discuss why I didn't really think that God created the universe and these kinds of things, um, because I'm sure, as you, you know, when when people do have very fixed views like that, then it's very, very difficult to have a reasonable conversation, and you know that basically. They think you're wrong and just want to convert you. They're actually not the slightest bit interested in what you have to say. So normally I try to move on from those kinds of conversations. Fortunately, when you're sitting in an airplane, it's a bit difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of a kind of slightly awkward moment for me. Anyway, but she was nice enough. I don't want to criticize her. And then after a while, we started talking not about... Well, the interesting thing was he started talking not about views but about what we do. And uh, I sort of explained a bit about the Santi Monastery and we have a sort of quiet place and people come there and we try to practice kindness and we try to give people a place where they can heal themselves and uh, uh, so on. And so, sure, that's, that's nice. And so, uh, and then she was telling me about the charity work that she's doing and so on. So when we were talking about practical doing things, it wasn't a problem. Yeah? It was only when we got to the views that... Uh, things became a bit awkward. So sometimes, it's interesting, sometimes in uh, uh, some of the work I do with textual studies that we look at uh, particular uh, ways, particular texts have passed down through the ages and how just a, a tiny little variation can, can signify a tremendously important shift in meaning. Yeah? Uh, I'll just give you one example that comes to mind from, from the Bible uh, is, is uh, many of you know uh, the, what became known as the Bush Doctrine. Yeah? And George Bush quoted, uh, if you're not for us, you're against us. Yeah? And uh, so that was actually a quote from the Gospels. Yeah? Uh, but the interesting thing was that the, that particular quote occurs in a number of forms in the Gospel. Uh, in, the, in different Gospels, and one form that it occurs, which is probably the earlier form and the more authentic one, is if you're not against us, you're for us. All right? <laughs> so it's actually two forms in the Gospels. One is if you're not for us, you're against us. The other one is if you're not against us, you're for us. 
Now that's quite a different perspective on the world, isn't it? Yeah? If you're not against us, you're for us. So uh, sometimes these tiny little differences can changes can make a big difference. And we can suspect, I mean, as, as scholars and so on, we build our, our careers out of, out of trying to find meaning in these little variations and so on. And, you, you know, sometimes you begin to wonder, does it actually, is there any point? Was it just an accident? Yeah? Was there really any, any major difference or difference in ideology behind that? And, uh, but sometimes there is. And in the case of the, the Metta Sutta translation that we chanted today, uh, we had two renderings. The one in the chanting book here, it says, by not holding to false views... Right, uh, and another version which some of you may know, which which is the one I actually learnt when I was a young monk in Thailand. The original translation was by not holding to fixed views. Right, so two renderings of the same line: by not holding to false views, and by not holding to fixed views. Now, in that case, there is actually because I know who did the translations, right. <laughs> And I know why they translated in that way. So I know very well that there is, in fact, quite a significant ideological difference in those two renderings. It's not just an accident. And the first translation, by not holding to fixed views, was done by Ajahn Suchito when he uh, did the original translation of the Metta Sutta into English about maybe 15, 20 years ago. And the, the change of that to false views was done by Ajahn Brahm when he... Uh, introduce that chant into Perth. So what, they give quite a different um, slant on things, don't they? By, when we say by not holding to fixed views, that's not pointing so much to the, uh, to the content of the view, but more to our attitude towards it. Yeah? Right? So this is the problem. The problem is that uh, we tend to get we tend to get too attached to the views that, that rendering emphasizes that side but but by hold, not holding to false views is more pointing to what is the actual content of the view is it right or is it wrong yeah? and so it's more of an objective sense now if you look at the pali the the, the translate the pali itself says dhintya anupagamma which literally means the literal translation is not going near views Right, not going near views, not or say not approaching views. Now, it doesn't say fixed views, it doesn't say false views. It just says views. Dippy. So, why are, are these two readings, and why uh, are they so different? <clears throat> well, so to understand that, we have to look a bit more at what a view is, and what the role it plays in the Dhamma. Now, where we translate as view. In Pali is dirti, and uh, uh, it's used to mean any kind of theory or opinion, any point of view, just in the ordinary way that, that we use that in English. Okay, so we render it as view. It's from the root, meaning to see. Okay, so it's very similar in the way that we use view. So view is quite a good uh, rendering of it, and it's used in in modern languages that that derive from. Uh, uh, Indic languages, it's used in the sense of theory. Okay? And the word theory itself derives from a word meaning to see. Uh, so that in uh, Thai, for example, you have the... It's, uh, Thai, the word dirti is used in the Sanskrit form and it's pronounced tritsidi. And uh, tritsidi uh, hangkwam uh, sampan is the theory of relativity. Or the tritsidi hangkwam wiwat is the theory of uh, evolution. So it's just a theory. It's a conceptual framework, uh, a set of ideas, um, a way of looking at things, as we call it, a dirti. Now, in Buddhism, in the Buddhist path, of course, if we look at the, the basic Buddhist teachings, we find that, that, that the, the Eightfold Path, the way of practicing Buddhism, starts with right view. Okay? Right view. And we're supposed to get rid of wrong view. Okay, so we have quite a dualistic perspective there, right? We have the right view and you have the wrong view. And that's what's uh, helping us along the path 
or establishing us in the right direction on the path. And that right view and wrong view is described in pretty straightforward terms and, and these, these path factors are given fairly clear, fairly straightforward definitions. And essentially what, what right view and wrong view, what right view means in that context is uh, a belief or an understanding of karma and the, the law of cause and effect in, in a moral or spiritual sense. Okay, so in fact what it means is that having, having an understanding or accepting the idea that one's own actions, one's own ethical choices will lead to results. Okay? And so that one therefore has to take responsibility for one's ethical choices. That's the essence of the doctrine of karma. You have to take responsibility for your own choices uh, because those choices lead to, lead to genuine results. Okay? So choosing good leads to happiness, choosing bad leads to suffering. And that's the essence of the belief in, in, in uh, of, the na of the question of right view. Uh, so, for example, uh, <coughs> um, uh, there is. Uh, I won't go into all the details of it, but but uh, for example, it's an acceptance of things like our, our, our duties of of gratitude to our parents is part of that. Yeah, so it's an acceptance that. Uh, because we've been given the gift of life, we've been brought up, we've been given so much from our parents that, that for us to have the uh, um, belief that there's a, there's, a, there's a moral debt that's owed there. Yeah? And so to understand that sense of gratitude. Uh, and the wrong view is essentially the view that that uh, our acts or our ethical choices um, have no consequence. So there's no good and there's no bad. Whatever we do, it doesn't really make any difference. In the Buddhist, uh, in the Buddha's time, there were certain teachers who taught that kind of doctrine, and uh, they they phrased it in a very very kind of out there kind of way. They said, you know, if you go all the way up the, the, the south bank of the Ganges and everyone you meet, you kill them and you reduce all the living beings on the south bank of the Ganges to just one mass of shredded flesh, then by doing so you don't do any bad. There's no moral consequence to that. And if you go down the north shore of the Ganges, and you give and do acts of charity, do acts of kindness and compassion, and do everything you can to serve and help people, then by doing that you're not doing any good. Right? So that's how you've got to admit that there's a certain kind of um, integrity <laughs> to that view. They, you know, whoever espoused that view, they, were, they had the integrity to follow through, they had the courage of their convictions. I don't know if they actually acted them out. Yeah? Um, but Obviously, it wouldn't have been a popular view, but you know there there are uh, people who believe that today. Yeah? People who believe there's really no such thing as right and wrong. So this is uh, the, the 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 basic understanding of right view is that simply we have to take ethical responsibility for our choices. Now it's important. To, 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 so there is some content to that, right? but it's important to, to know that that isn't um, what, what's included in right view is not like a, 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 a belief in a, in a set of uh, kind of dogmatic statements. Okay? So, the, so, so we're not concerned in Buddhism to, to sort of make a creed of, of affirmations and say we have to believe in X, Y, Z, and so on and so forth to be able to be call ourselves Buddhists. Okay, we, we don't think in that t in those terms, right? So we don't define ourselves as a religion by our belief or by our faith in the same way as some religions do. This is something that that uh, I've been having some uh, uh, discussion on recently. One of the I'm working with one of the interfaith groups in Australia called the APRO, Australian Partnership of Religious Organisations. And uh, one of the things I try to do is to represent a, a Buddhist point of view uh, because they're used to working mainly within the Abrahamic religions. 
and so <coughs> they always you always talk about religions as a faith. You say we're, you know all the faiths in Australia and all the, the the beliefs, and I sort of have to say, well, actually in Buddhism, yes, we have faith, but we don't call ourselves a faith. And Buddhism has never defined itself as a faith yeah, in that same way. We call ourselves, Buddhist religion is called, in Indian languages, is called a dhamma. Yeah? So a dhamma doesn't mean a faith. A dhamma means a truth. Yeah? It means a, a, um, a teaching, perhaps. Yeah? Or we call, it's called a sasana. So we use the word sasana is used to describe a religion, but sasana means an instruction. Again, an instruction or a teaching. Okay, it doesn't mean a faith. So we could also describe Buddhism as a as a magga, yeah, as a path or a way. So we'd be happy with those descriptions of Buddhism, but we don't think of ourselves as a faith in that kind of term. Uh, so so far, I haven't had any success in in convincing the uh, followers of other religions to change the way that we talk about uh, interreligious dialogue, but yeah, I keep on trying. So, the, um, look, I'm, just, I'm just thinking, it's getting a little bit hot in here. I know we, we just closed the, the back there. Do you, do you want to maybe close, open the, open the back door on such a warm day? I don't think there's too much noise out there today. So even though we shouldn't be, you know, as Buddhists, we shouldn't be hung up on, on uh, uh, view and so on, but, but all too often it does happen. And, and you do get quite a lot of fundamentalism in Buddhism as well as in, in, in other religions. For example, I heard of a monk who was in Burma at one of the monasteries there, and uh, they, were, they got in big trouble because um, they dared to suggest that the, the, um, that the, in, in the Buddhist... Jataka stories tells the tale of how the rabbit got on the moon. Okay? <laughs> and they dared to suggest that, that there's not really a rabbit on the moon. Yeah? <laughs> and that maybe it, was, uh, maybe it was just a folk tale and wasn't like a real story of how the rabbit came to be on the moon. And uh, so they got in big trouble for that because you know, they didn't have the faith and, and the teachings. So there is that tendency to... Uh, take things too literally and to insist on things too literally. And if you look at the Buddhist scriptures, then there are plenty of things that you can find in there that are not literally true. For example, the Buddhist scriptures talk about Mount Meru as being a great mountain to the north of, of India. It's supposed to be 84,000 leagues high. Yeah, 84,000 leagues is about 10 miles or so, so say, say 20 kilometers, so 84,000. How many is that? More than a million, maybe two million kilometers, something like that. Uh, how, how far is two million kilometers? It's a long way. It's a lot higher than the, than the tallest mountain. I think it's halfway to the moon or something, isn't it? So there's no Mount Meru. It doesn't exist. Yeah? It's, it's a myth, mythological creation. Uh, or in the scriptures it talks about uh, beings who, creatures who live in the ocean that are like 100 leagues long. Yeah? So again, that's maybe... 100 leagues, maybe 2,000 kilometers long. Okay, so there are some pretty big squid in the ocean and some big whales and things like that, but they're not quite that long. So this is, these are just kind of folk beliefs and things which have crept into the scriptures. And, and it's not, uh, it never has been really part of Buddhist belief to, to kind of, you know, say that we must accept all of these things very literally. That's not the important thing. Important thing is, uh, again, to come back to that taking responsibility for our actions, and that um, that principle applies uh, really in two ways. In the ordinary way, in the law of karma, what that means is that if we do good, we'll be happy; if we do bad, we'll be sad. Very simply. Now, 
in that respect as an ethical principle. Okay, so that so in that respect, karma at its, at its basic level or worldly level is an ethical principle. Okay, and as an, and it's and, and we should notice it's also an empirical principle. Okay, it's pointing to a causal relationship. Okay, which can be tested. Right? We can actually see, we can actually put that into practice and see within our own minds. Yeah, we can see. Okay, if I'm doing an act which is leading, which is um, bad based on a, a, an unwholesome motivation, is it based on greed, hatred, and delusion? Then how does that affect my mind? Yeah? Now, of course, it's not always obvious what the connection is, right? But in many cases, it's quite obvious. And in many cases, we can actually see that if we're doing something we know is wrong, yeah, when we're able to let go of that. It makes us feel happy, yeah. and I'm sure all of you have done that many times. You've all seen that at work. We've all got a sense for how our own actions and our own choices will affect our own happiness and the happiness of those around us. So, on that level, the the, the, the law of karma is an empirical principle, which is a guide for our ethical conduct. But on a more profound level, uh, that 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 question occurs as the the, the principle of um, the four noble truths. Right? So understanding four noble truths. So the deep level of right view, what they sometimes call the the lokutara, or the transcendental right view, is understanding the four noble truths: the truth that of suffering, the origin of suffering, the ending of suffering, and the path leading to the ending of suffering. So here, with the Four Noble Truths, we're not just talking about how to be happy and how to avoid sadness and so on, but, but we're talking about how to transcend uh, all pain and pleasure. We're talking about how to tr transcend notions of good and evil. We're talking about how to transcend all of the suffering that we can find in, in the world. And so this is happening at a much more profound level. But it's the same basic principle because the cause of suffering is our own attachments, our own cravings, our own delusions and stupidities and ignorance and all of those things. So it's the same basic principle that we take responsibility for our own choices. And so if we're pursuing that, that course of right view within a Buddhist framework, you know, if you see in, in uh, uh, traditional Buddhist countries and Buddhist cultures that the normal thing people want to do is they want to, uh, and they want to use Buddhism for, is to, to do something good so that they can get something good back. Right? They call spiritual materialism. Right? So you want to make a good spiritual investment. And uh, so you want to sort of give some dana, and when you go and you make an offering, and then when you do the offering, you go and you pray, oh, may I get a new Mercedes, or may I get, you know, something, may I pass my school exams, or whatever it is. And so you want to get something back. Well, I learned that very early on when I was in Thailand, and uh, I was talking to this, um, someone who was working in, one of the restaurants there, and she was saying she was going to make go take go to the temple and take an offering, some food for the for the monks at the temple, and she said she was going to b take this particular food because that was her favourite, and she said that that was their belief that if they offer that food, then that's what they'll get to eat when they go to heaven, yeah. <laughs> so you better offer what your favourite food is so you can have when you go to heaven. The difference is when you eat it when you go to heaven, it doesn't make you fat. So that's good. So that means that the monks get given all the fattening food. And uh, <laughs> so that's a way of looking at it. So, in, I mean, in, in a sense, from a Buddhist point of view, that's not kind of wrong thinking. It's just very limited thinking. It's very literal thinking, very kind of narrow way of looking at things. But still, the basic, when we take that basic principle, we apply it on a deep level, profound level. We let go of everything. And that's where we find really true peace. So this right view is something which starts out on a, on a, like a mundane or an ordinary level and then deepens and deepens and deepens in our own understanding, our own practice until it becomes what we call transcendental right view. So this is uh, 
again, one aspect of views, okay, that I'm talking about now, and that is what is the, the right way of looking at things. Now, when we um, reflect on that, we can ask a simple question. What kind of spiritual life would be possible if we didn't have that kind of right view? Okay, so if we were to say, for example, that we don't, we, we don't believe that we should accept uh, uh, responsibility for our ethical choices, then what kind of spirituality is going to eventuate from that? And the Buddha's answer was none, really. And he said it's impossible to, to, to live uh, a good and pure spiritual life unless you accept that basic principle. Right? And so there are other ways of looking at the world. For example, another way of looking at the world is to say everything's random. Okay, so happiness and sadness, good and bad, it's just random, right? It's not determined by your choices. And so if you believe that, then what kind of spiritual life are you going to really live? Another, another belief system is that everything's predetermined, okay? Whatever you choose, it doesn't make any difference. Choice is an illusion, right? So again, the, the question the Buddha would say is, what kind of spiritual life, what kind of brahmacharya is possible there? And he would say there isn't. Or what if he said that everything is determined by God, everything is, is determined by a creator God, he controls everything. And again, you have to ask, well, what kind of spiritual life is there? If, if God is, is everything, then I can't make any choices. Yeah? I can't actually choose to do anything. It's up to God to save me or to condemn me. And so these are the uh, problems which uh, people within those belief systems struggle with. And if you look at the history, for example, the history of Christianity I've been reading a little bit recently, they're struggling with that very same question. Yeah? Uh, if God is the one who created everything uh, and, and he's the all-powerful one, how can our choices make a difference? Yeah? And so this is one of the great dilemmas which the church has always wrestled with. Uh, and the, the, you know, one of the most influential positions that was reached on that was by St. Augustine around the, the 5th century. And he basically said, you, 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 your choices don't make any difference. That was basically his position, was that, that human, uh, the human capacity to choose is so weak. Our, our slaves, uh, enslavement to sin is so great. And the possibility for us to do any, make any meaningful choices is so, so impoverished that actually we can't really do anything and all we can do is cast ourselves at the feet of the church and let the church dispense its saving grace so the, the grace of, of God comes to us through the church and uh, so that's his solution to that problem and of course you know different different Christians and so on have found different solutions to the problem so from the Buddhist point of view we don't have that problem okay we have as a se the central tenet is the belief that our choices are going to affect our spiritual life. And the living of a true spiritual life without that principle is, at the very least, deeply problematic. If not completely impossible. So it's in that sense which... Uh, uh, you know, right view is something which we should accept. Okay. Now, as well as this idea, this kind of dualistic idea of views that I've been talking about, right views and wrong views, there's also another way which is talked about in the suttas where the Buddha is saying, get rid of views. All right? And this is very prominent, uh, especially in a, a section of the uh, book called the Sutta Nipata, and one particular section of that called the Artakavaga. Now, the Artakavaga is a very interesting uh, collection of early poetry, which the uh, Buddhist scholars regard as being one of the earliest, if not the earliest, of all the Buddhist texts. Okay, some people even uh, go so far. I've heard of it. I've heard of one monk who's gone so far as to reject everything all the Buddhist scriptures and only accept the Atikavaga, right? It's one collection of about half a dozen poems, okay? And that's the only real Buddha, Buddha's teachings that we have, okay? Everything else is a later interpolation, right? Just that much. And when we find, look at the Atikavaga, I think that's, that's a bit slightly extreme point of view myself, but 
when we look at the Atikawaga, one of the things that it, it emphasizes very much is this whole thing of not of, of, of just getting rid of all kind of views and attachment to views and saying that as soon as you get involved in views, you get involved in conflict. And that's one of the main messages is, is that, that, that as soon as you believe one thing, somebody else will come along and say, I believe the other, and then that will give rise to conflict. It's much better to just get rid of all views, let go of all views, and then you'll be peaceful. Now, that particular teaching is... Uh, it's a very powerful one, presented very beautifully in those verses. It's a, it's a teaching which has a particular context, yeah? and the context is the uh, society of ascetics, the culture of ascetics and philosophers and monks and so on in the time of the Buddha. And if you've been to India and you know Indian people, you know the one thing about Indians is they love to have a good argument. right? especially about philosophy and religion and so on. And this is a timeless quality, right? And so they love to get together and debate endlessly about kind of different kind of abstruse philosophical things and the whole of Indian literature is full of these things. And, and it was actually a recognized form or, of the spiritual life is that that's what you did. And there's stories in the Buddhist scriptures, for example, uh, one of the nuns, Bhadda Kundala Kesa, was famous because she... Before she became a Buddhist nun, she was a Jain nun. And then she, she ended up refuting all the Jain doctrines and getting to saying, I, I don't believe this anymore. And so she just became a wandering ascetic. And she would go to the town, and outside the town she would set up a stick. And, uh, and it was like a kind of post of defiance. And she'd say, OK, anyone come and, def and debate with me here, and I'll, I'll, I'll beat you in, de in debate and would challenge anybody to come and debate with her. And she went around the whole of India debating anyone who came to her and beating them all until, of course, she came to... Venerable Sariputta came to debate with her. And then, of course, being a Buddhist story, yeah, <laughs> he won the debate and uh, she became a Buddhist nun. She, she gave her the whole thing and then he, he asked one question. He said, he said, what is the one? And she was stumped. She couldn't answer that. Yeah, she, I don't know. She obviously she hadn't seen the Matrix or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what is the one? Uh, is the answer? Just in case, in case this ever happens to you, right? You've got to be careful. The answer is all beings, or the answer is all beings su survive on food. Yeah. All beings have to eat. It's according to Buddhism, is the, the first principle. Huh? Everyone has to eat. So, so this is just an example of the debating culture in ancient India. So, so this is what, and, and it's still very much alive in Buddhism, especially in Tibetan Buddhism. Yeah? And they still have the very formalized debates where they're taught how to debate and, and so on. It's still, that's kept alive in that uh, particular school. The, in the East, the, those forms of Buddhism which are more influenced by East Asian culture, that aspect of debating has fallen away. And that's very much because of the Chinese influence. So according to Chinese culture, uh, gentlemen don't argue. Right? And so you find kind of ways of getting around things rather than, than clashing directly. Yeah? And so that's very much influenced the whole of East Asian Buddhism, including Buddhism in Thailand and, and uh, Cambodia and Myanmar and so on. Is that's a Chinese influence there. But the Indian sphere uh, was very interested in debating. So these verses in the Atikawaga are really, what they're pointing to is, you know, these kind of, Endless philosophical things. And what was one very interesting uh, uh, teaching the Buddha gave where he said that when, when uh, lay people conflict and argue, they tend to conflict and argue about uh, um, uh, uh, um, like objects of desire. Okay? So they, are, they argue about things that they want to have. Right? So you can see that's usually what war goes, or goes about, you know, the two people conflicting about some resources or some land or something like that. They want something. When, when monks argue, they argue about views, right? So we're not conflicting about getting things and about material things, but we're conflicting about ideas. Right? So I think that's quite a, quite a nice uh, distinction there. So this is what these, these, these 
uh, verses are pointing to us is this kind of thing of letting go. And, uh, and there's a beautiful, verse, beautiful line there. It says, it's one who neither takes up anything nor puts anything down. Yeah? Atangwa ni ratangwa. Neither taking up anything nor putting down anything. And so these, this is this is like another um, uh, perspective on views, but of course that perspective on views, if we start to look at it, take it a bit more seriously, itself is a bit problematic, and that that problematic nature of it is also raised in one one uh, suttas where 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 somebody comes to the Buddha and says, "I have this view. My view is nothing whatsoever is pleasing to me." And the Buddha says, well, that view of yours, nothing whatsoever is pleasing to me. Is that view of yours pleasing to you? <laughs> yeah? So, that's the point. When, when you say you're not going to have any views, the reality is you still have your views. Yeah? But if you say... I'm not going to have any views. What you're doing is, is, is you're not um, reflecting on your views. You're not admitting them. Yeah? And that's very, very important. Okay? The, the, we need views. That's part of how our mind works. Our mind works with concepts. It works with ideas. Yeah? It's part of the structure of consciousness. You can't, it, just doesn't, it just doesn't operate without having some kind of framework in which to do it. But the, the point is that those views need to be made conscious. And when we make them conscious, we can investigate them, we can reflect on them, we can modify them when they need to be modified. Yeah? So in that sense, the, the views in Buddhism are more like a hypothesis. Okay? So more like we treat a hypothesis in science, that it's something you make it. What are your assumptions? So you know, as soon as you start saying, I don't have any assumptions, that's an act of denial. Yeah? You're actually pretending that there aren't any. You make the assumptions as, as conscious as you can, then you're able to investigate how realistic are they, and then you can change them as you go along. Uh, and so that's the, this is that that nexus of that kind of difference of not having fixed views and not having false views. Yeah, not having fixed views is good because you know once if 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 you if you get you too insistent on the views, this is what the, the Buddha called uh, uh, abhinivesa. And uh, uh, only this is true, everything else is rubbish. Okay? So this is what the Buddha called Abhinivesa, Idameva Satchang Moghamanyang. Only this is true, everything else is false. Right? So, so the Buddha's response to that it was the, uh, uh, the phrase, Sabbe Dhamma Nalang Abhinivesa Naya. All Dhammas are not worth insisting on. Okay, so this is this is this is the the one teaching that I gave to my dad when I was with him in Coffs Harbour. He said, "What's what? What's one thing that Buddhism teaches?" And I said, "Nothing is worth insisting on." He said, "Okay, that's good. That's all I want. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is worth insisting on." So from then on, he would never insist on anything. He, he would just say, "I I highly recommend that you do this." <laughs> Difficult to get that concept across to his pet dogs. Yeah. I highly recommend that you stop jumping on the furniture right now. <laughs> so, uh, nothing whatsoever is worth insisting on. Right? So, this is kind of idea. And, and we all know what that's like. Yeah? And, and, and that, you know, even if, you've, even if you're right, yeah, then your attachment to your idea of being right it's, can be very painful. Yeah? Uh, and... Um, we all know how, how annoying it is, you know, like when somebody, especially when somebody's newly converted, you know, like if someone's given up cigarettes or something like that, then they're a complete pain in the butt and they go around telling everyone how virtuous they are. <laughs> Same thing if you're newly converted to Buddhism and you want to go around telling everybody how good Buddhism is, yeah? Don't, please, please, okay? <laughs> out of compassion and out of help for the sasana, we should make, like, make a rule that no one's allowed to talk about Buddhism. If you become a Buddhist, you're not allowed to talk about Buddhism for at least two or three years after that. <laughs> Just chill out a bit, take it easy, it's okay. And uh, just, just chill, yeah. So this is this kind of insistence. 
And, you know, you can see a lot of that in Dhamma, and if you want to see it, you, you go to a lot of the Buddhist websites where they have the forums and, and chat groups and everyone kind of arguing with each other about the interpretation of the fourth jhana or whatever it is. And uh, so this is this uh, Abhinivesa. So the fixed views is no good, and the false views also is no good. Yeah. So if, we, if, we, if we're really having ideas in our minds which are um, obstructive, and not uh, conducive to our, our practice of the holy life, then this is going to be uh, uh, an obstacle for us. And so we have to be investigating these things. So false. I, I've explained right view and wrong view in very simple terms this evening. Of course, there's a lot more to it than that. And it's something which we need to keep on investigating. Because you can't just say, I'm going to get rid of false views and have right views. Yeah? It's some, our views and ideas about things, I think, are, are, very, are very flexible. They're very complex. They're always changing. They manifest in different ways. We see them coming up in thought patterns yeah? when maybe we're blaming somebody else for, for our problems. Yeah? And then we say, actually, there's a kind of wrong view there. Yeah? Our problems actually come from inside. Yeah? And so we see those thought patterns. And the more we can be aware of that, the more we can investigate it, then the more we're able to change it and to improve it. So actually, this, the, 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 the uh, right views and the wrong views and the, the fixed views, all of that is sort of implied in that thing, Adityantya Anupagamma. But one reason uh, why Ajahn Brahm, and I, I know he preferred the re rendering of false views in that context, was because uh, the phrasing of Adityantya Anupagamma is meant to and clearly refers back to a, a, a more clear, and more straightforward passage found frequently in the prose sutta. So, Dictension of Bhagama in the Metta Sutta, we have a, a poetry. Okay, so as poetry, of course, it's elusive; it's not uh, definitive. And the the prose context where it comes in, it says, "Ubho uh, ante anupagama, majima patipadata targetena abhisambuddha." in the Dhamma Chakapavatana Sutta. And so it's the same word, anupagamma, not going near. Yeah? So it's a clear allusion to it. Those two extremes. Okay? So not, not going near those two extremes, the Tathagata teaches by the, by, uh, uh, by the middle way, majhena dhamang deseti, by the mean or by the middle way. Okay? And that by the middle way, uh, whenever that's explained. So the two extremes in that case would be, for example, uh, the classic set of extremes is the extreme of eternalism, believing that you've got an eternal soul that lives forever, uh, or the extreme of annihilationism, the belief that, that all there is is this physical body and at the end of this life there's nothing else. Okay? So these are the two extremes. Not going near those two extremes, the Buddha teaches by means of dependent origination, okay? causality, conditionality. Things are not either fixed and eternal nor are they, is there nothingness and meaninglessness, but there's relationship, there's context, okay? there's interconnection, and this is what we actually experience in our lives. So there are many different ways of phrasing these two extremes. Another way it says everything is oneness is one extreme, everything is diversity is another extreme. Yeah? So this is another one that's quite interesting. Yeah? If, you, if, you, if you assert everything is really one, that's an extreme. If you insert everything is... Diverse is another extreme. Not teaching either of those which we teach. Dependent origination, that things are interconnected, interrelated. Yeah? So notions of oneness and diversity are actually uh, themselves dependent notions. They're not absolutes. So this is my little talk for you this evening on views, false views, fixed views, right views, wrong views, no views, and so on. You know, you have even many more. Like if you look at YouTube, it'll say, you know, 100,000 views. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of problem that is? Okay, so did anyone have any 